Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Eric. My sobriety date is July 12, 1993, and I'm a member of the baby group of Alcoholics Anonymous. We meet on Sundays and Thursdays, Sundays for an open speaker meeting and Thursdays for a closed discussion. If you're ever in the north end of Toronto, please come up and see us. We'd love to see you there. It's a great traditional group of Alcoholics Anonymous, and you'll get a warm handshake. You'll get a good cup of coffee, and you'll enjoy a good meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. (sighs) Well, this sounded like a real good idea at the time. When Pat called me about a year ago, I thought this was the greatest sin in the world. And as I led up to this today, I've just had a fantastic time at this conference. This conference has been unbelievable. The energy that you people have, and we hear it in Alcoholics Anonymous about pockets of enthusiasm. And you here in Minneapolis, or Minnesota, Minneapolis, sure are a pocket of enthusiasm in Alcoholics Anonymous. So, fantastic stuff. I have thoroughly enjoyed this conference up till right now. (laughs) Thoroughly enjoyed it. I'd first of all, I'd like to thank Pat for asking me to come here and speak. Uh, It's a privilege and an honor to do anything in Alcoholics Anonymous, but when you come here and you get asked to speak in front of 6,000 people or how many are ever here or whatever it is, it, it really is a privilege because I'll tell you, 12 and a half years ago, People weren't clapping when I was coming to the front of a room. (laughs) And to me, that's the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous, what it's done in my life. I can't say enough about this program and and, and the life and the changes that have happened to me through you people and just by showing up and doing what you people have asked me to do in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's bizarre to me. Pat, thank you very much. And the committee, the Gopher State Committee, thank you so much. I'd like to thank my host, John, for having me for for taking care of me, and uh, he's done a great job. We haven't spent a lot of time. I'm one of these guys, and my sponsor's the same way, that, you know, we come to a conference, we like to take part as much as we can in the conference. And and so, but John's been there whenever we've needed him, and and I thank you very much. Another person I'd like to thank tonight is my sponsor, Butch, who's here with me tonight. Uh, I'm sure some of you around here have heard Butch speak from, he's been in the Minnesota area a few times, and, and, and it means an awful lot to me to have him here tonight. Uh, when, when this is the biggest conference that I've ever spoke at, and, and to have him here tonight is a, a real honor, and I love you dearly, my friend. So, um, I guess we'll just get on with it. <laughs> keep it in the words of Dr. Bob, keep the Freudian complex of the scientific mind, AA's values of simplicity must prevail, and they do. I was down in Cleveland a few years ago when I was about two years sober, and there was a man named Jack Sullivan down there speaking. And he had a friend named Wino Joel from Tyler, Texas. And you know those 20 questions on the yellow sheet that they ask? They ask, if you're an alcoholic, you're an alcoholic. Well, those were written by a psychologist out of John Hopkins University. And Jack and Joe used to get a little pissed off that a professional man would be calling an alcoholic an alcoholic. So they decided to write a few of their own questions. And one of them was, have you ever, have you ever had the roof of your mouth sunburn? <laughs> have you ever been arrested while in jail? <laughs> have you ever been run over by your own car while driving? <laughs> and probably the granddaddy of them all, have you mastered the art out of puking out of a moving vehicle without any of it coming back at you? And it's interesting, as you look around the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, you see people going, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. (laughs) If that makes a lot of sense to you, you're in the right place. How many newcomers are here? How many people under your sobriety? Raise your hand. (laughs) Pat, there's your cleanup crew. Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. 
There's two things the city of Toronto and, and Minnesota have in common. One that we hosted the, uh, the international conference in 2005, and you hosted it in 2000. And from what I understand, both cities did a wonderful job. So for now, we'll call ourselves the Twin Cities. <laughs> the other thing that we have in common is both the Minnesota Wild and the Toronto Maple Leafs didn't make the playoffs. <laughs> there you go. Now, I've got a story, and I heard this story, and I know it's a true story because this came from an alcoholic that's way up in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I know this guy would never lie to me because there's a lot of people out there that think, if our lips are moving, we're lying. But this guy's way up in AA. I, he's way up there, so I know this is the truth. And I don't know, but for people that came to the conference in, in Toronto, the international conference, about a week or two before the conference happens, they have a press conference with the mayor of Toronto, and there's always people sitting there asking a bunch of questions, and he answers a bunch of questions. It was the 70th birthday of AA. There was going to be about 45 to 50,000 people here in Toronto, and it was just going to be a party, and you know what it was like, because you had it here in Minnesota. And there's one reporter that got right up to him, and he said, Mr. Mayor, he said, we're going to have 40 or 50,000 alcoholics in Toronto for four days. He said, Mr. Mayor, do you think Alcoholics Anonymous works? And the mayor shot right back, and he said, I sure hope so, or this city's in big trouble. <laughs> I sure hope Alcoholics Anonymous works, too. I have another story, and, and I just love, I got to hear the two al -Anon speakers here, and they were just fantastic. Didn't they just do a terrific job? Just fantastic. I had the opportunity of listening to Linda. I, I chaired our conference in Toronto in March, and, and Bob and Linda came down, and, and they got to be our AA al -Anon couple, and they just did a fantastic job. And uh, uh, So I know what it's like to put on one of these deals. And I'll tell you, I don't ever want to do it again. <laughs> but I know this is a true story again, because this was another alcoholic who's really high up there. I think he's above the other guy that told me the story. So I know this was true again. And it's about an Al-Anon lady and an AA guy, and the lady goes to Al-Anon, and the AA guy's, you know, he's in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous and all this, and this goes on for about 25 years, and this guy gets no period of sobriety, whatever. And, you know, when we keep doing that to ourselves, you know what happens. We end up dying. And this guy ended up dying, and his wife had him cremated. And then she mixed his ashes with some marijuana. And she smoked them. And she went around the country telling, that's, uh, telling people that's the best that sucker ever made her feel in 25 years of marriage. I want you to know that I came into Alcoholics Anonymous on July 11, 1993, and I didn't come here to get sober. I came here to watch a one-year medallion for a friend of my brother, Paul, who's got 18 years in this program. And I came to watch this one-year medallion because Paul wanted me to come watch it. And Paul had been in Alcoholics Anonymous for about four and a half years. And I want to talk a little bit about that first meeting because I really believe that God works through the people in Alcoholics Anonymous. I believe that the Word of God comes through people in Alcoholics Anonymous. And what happened to me at my meeting, I hope that somebody's here will get the same thing that I got out of my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, is the first thing I got is I got hope. When I came through the doors of AA, I saw some hope for the first time in a long, long time because I hadn't had any hope in my life for an awful long time. So when I came in that night at the Bayview Group, and the Bayview Group was about 200 people at its open meeting on a Sunday night, I got hope. And there were people there that were laughing and scratching and having a good time, and you could tell that these people were enjoying life. The second thing I saw that night, I saw people that were excited about being sober and Alcoholics Anonymous. And I don't know about you, but I was never excited about being sober. That didn't work for me. And I saw people that were excited about doing this deal. 
I saw people just having a good time and really enjoying themselves. So those were the first two things that I saw when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. And if anybody's here tonight, and and if you haven't got that out of this weekend here this weekend, I don't know, but keep coming here. Because I, I had to have some hope, and I had to have some excitement. And that's exactly what happened to me at my first meeting. And again, I said that God speaks through the people in Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's exactly what happened that night. I can remember up there, and we give out chips in Toronto. I don't know if you guys give them out here, but we give them out for certain periods under a year's sobriety. Nine, six, three, two, and one month. And what we have, we have a desire chip for anybody coming back or anybody that wants to start this way of life. And so the lady, you got to understand, is in the front row, this friend of my brother's was, my brother Paul was chairing the meeting in the front row where Bob was sitting, my mom was, my brother was sitting right next, uh, right next to Bob, a friend of my brother's was sitting right there, and I was sitting right where Eric was sitting. And the lady, the secretary of the group that night, she got up and she said, is there anybody here that has nine months of sobriety? Anybody here that has six months? Anybody here that has three months and two months and one month? And then it got down to that desire chip. And she said, is there anybody here that has a desire to stop drinking? And my whole family looked down at me like that. (laughs) I'm going, no, I don't want to do anything about that. I'm going, no, no, no. (laughs) Absolutely not. Don't want to do anything about that. You know, my life's a complete mess. I have had no hope in my life for an awful long time, and I still didn't want to do anything about my drinking. Because if you're anything like me, drinking is my solution. It's my solution from feeling restless, irritable, and discontent. It's my solution from all the fear and resentment and anger and all that stuff that we feel and the pain and humiliation. Just to be able, I can't look at myself anymore because I can't stand who I am. And I can't stand the environment that I live in. My environment threatens me on a regular basis and I don't like myself. And I need to drink just to get rid of that. You know? And so when that meeting was, when that meeting was going on that night, it was an open speaker meeting. When that meeting was going on that night, there was a lady up there speaking. Her name was Terry. She was a counselor at the Renaissance Center. And she didn't talk a lot about drinking. She talked a lot about how she felt and the feelings she felt and the pain and humiliation that she felt that night. And she talked about stuff that made sense to a guy like me. She talked about hiding booze in her own apartment when she was the only one that lived there. (laughs) And if you're an alcoholic, you know what I mean. You know what I mean. And then she talked about the fear, and she talked about the anxiety, and she talked about all that stuff, and she talked about how alcohol just seemed to let that down, and then the consequences became higher and higher and higher. And about halfway through that meeting, I started to catch just a little bit of alcoholism. Just a tiny bit. That's it. Just a tiny bit. And when that meeting was over that night, I was a full-blown alcoholic with a disease of alcoholism, and folks, I haven't had a drink since. Somewhere in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it says, when armed with proper facts about myself, not about AA, about myself, we can generally win the confidence of another alcoholic over within a few hours where people have been trying for years and years and years to do that. So you tell me that God didn't speak through the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous that night. I had some kind of spiritual awakening, some kind of spiritual experience that night, because I'm here to tell you that since that day I have not had the desire to have a drink. I haven't had an obsession to have a drink, and and, and life has been pretty good since that time. And the reality is, is that's because I really believe Alcoholics Anonymous works all the time. And the message was there that night. They talk about this program being attraction rather than promotion. Well, I can tell you, folks, sometimes we have to promote the attraction. (laughs) And that's what happened to me that night. And I watched my brother for four and a half years turn his life around. I watched my brother for four years win the the respect of my parents back, win the respect of my brothers back, win the respect of his employers and his friends back. I watched this happen right in front of my eyes. And going to that one meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, my life changed. You know? I'm going to talk a little bit about 
how I felt before I even picked up a drink. I'm going to talk a little bit of drinking to identify with you people. But I'm going to tell you right now, I don't talk a lot about drinking because most of the stuff I remember never happened. I come from this family, and, and there's a lot of stories that you've heard this weekend, and, I, and I'm glad I get to share mine because there's a lot of stories in Alcoholics Anonymous about different backgrounds and how people were brought up and all that, and I can tell you that my family was a loving family. My mother and father gave us everything we needed. We didn't get everything we wanted. We got everything we needed, and we especially got the love that we needed. As I look back on it today and I see my parents, my mom's name is Elma and my dad's name is Rich. My two parents are the most unselfish people I've ever met in my life. And as I look back on it now, we grew up in middle class Thornhill, which is a little, little suburb outside, outside Toronto. And as I said, we got everything we needed. We didn't get everything we wanted. And we got the love. You know, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about my, my, my family. My dad was the captain of the university hockey University of Toronto Hockey Blues. He was a captain of that team. My mom played hockey till she was 39 years old. She taught me everything I know about the game. She taught me how to skate. She taught me how to shoot. And if there had been an Olympic team back in those days, my mom would have been the top-rated player. And I'm here to tell you that right now. And so I had these two loving parents. And I got, I'm the youngest of four boys. I got three older brothers, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. My oldest brother, Barry, is a Baptist minister. He left, he left, uh, he, 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 was, he was a big drinker. He was a big drinker for an awful long time, and at 21 years of age, he decided to quit drinking and decided to get into the ministry. Now, I think Barry had a problem with alcohol, but Barry found his way out. And the common thread that we have with a guy like Barry is we all found God. We all found God, and it doesn't matter how we do it. Is Alcoholics Anonymous for everyone? I don't know. All I know for sure is that AA is for me. That's all I know for sure. And so Barry found his way out. Barry went back to school. He got his doctorate in teaching. He now teaches in a little, about an hour outside Toronto, in a little town called Cambridge, and he teaches Bible college and is assistant pastor at a church. I got another brother that makes you sick. This guy works the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and his 12 principles in his life, and he doesn't even know it. He just, everything he touches turns to gold. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about Scott, because it's a little important for me today to talk about Scott, and you'll find out why in a second. Scott left home, home when he was 16 years old to go play junior hockey in Kingston, Ontario. And he went and did that, and he played three years there, and he really excelled there. He signed a professional contract with the New York Islanders. He played seven, he played about 25 games in the NHL, but mostly in the minors. He came home every summer from the age of 20 to 27 and went to school. And when he retired from hockey, because he knew he wasn't going to make it full time, when he retired for hockey at 27, he went back to get his, uh, he went, he went back to get his BA. Once he finished his BA, he went on to three, three years at college, at university, at law school, at Osgoode Hall, one of the best law schools in Canada. He went on and did that, graduated within the two, top two percent of his class he went on to article at a place called Tory and Tory one of the top firms in Toronto he did that for two years then he got a call from the Edmonton Oilers and they asked him to be the assistant general manager of their farm team out in Cape Breton Nova Scotia and he went and did that for a couple years he moved the team from there to Hamilton stayed there for a couple years and when Kevin Lowe got hired by the Edmonton Oilers to be their general manager he hired my brother Scott to be his assistant general manager Scott's got three beautiful kids. He's got a lovely wife. He makes a six-figure salary. And every once in a while, I try and get him to admit of all the fun he missed out on that I was having. <laughs> he just won't do it. He just won't do it. And then there's my brother, Paul, who me and Paul never spoke until I never spoke that much. And all we did was constantly fight when I, when I was drinking and he was still sober. And when we were drinking together... It was just like oil and water. It was just a bad, bad mix. Paul's my hero today. Paul's my hero because Paul gave me Alcoholics Anonymous. Paul showed me Alcoholics Anonymous. Paul didn't tell me about Alcoholics Anonymous. Paul showed me Alcoholics Anonymous. 
And me and Paul have a good relationship today. Paul really doesn't come to a lot of meetings of AA anymore. He got married to an alcoholic. They have a lovely life out in Whippy, Ontario, which is about 40 minutes from where I live. They got two kids. Would I like to see him come to more meetings? Yes, I would. But the reality is that's none of my business anymore. He seems to be going on with his life, and that's great. So I come from this family that's a good family. We got two alcoholics that are, that are, that, that, two, two boys that are alcoholic, two boys that aren't alcoholic. We all grew up in the same house together. We all petted the same dog. We all opened the same fridge. You know, we all had the same parents. And two are alcoholic and two aren't alcoholic. And why I say that <clears throat> is because one of the things that I find going on in Alcoholics Anonymous is we got to stop playing the victims. I've come to understand in AA that victims do not get better in Alcoholics Anonymous. They die an inch a day for years and years and years. Until I was able to take full responsibility for my sad lot in life, I was never going to get better in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, the bottom line is that, you know what, alcoholics are amazing people because, you know what, we're the victims of everything. And the reality is it doesn't matter which where the sun comes up if you got improperly toilet trained. It really doesn't matter. The reality is, is that until I was to accept within my innermost self that I have the disease of alcoholism, I was never going to get better here. And that's just the reality of it. I see people blame people for years and years and years, and you see them stay angry, and you see them not forgiving, and you see them go out and get drunk again. And that's just the reality of alcoholism. I failed grade five. I failed grade five. How do you fail grade five? Every time I say that, I have about two or three people come up to me and say, Eric, I failed grade five too. <laughs> I failed grade five. And why I talk about this, and I'm going to make a couple quick points about the disease of perception. And I'll tell you, folks, I have never met anybody in Alcoholics Anonymous that comes into these rooms that has a good self-image of who they are. I've never met anybody come through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous that loves the people they are. I've met hundreds of people come through the doors of AA that are in love with themselves, but I've never met anybody who actually loves the person they are. And so I can tell you, at an early age, my self-image of self was not good. And I failed grade five. And how does that affect me? All my buddies are moving up to grade six. The teachers are the teachers saying, hey, Eric, you got to stay here. All your buddies are going up here. What are they trying to say to me? They're saying, Eric, you're not quite as good as them. They're going here. You're going here. Now, is that what they're trying to get across to a 9- or 10-year-old boy? Of course not. But that's exactly the way I see it. The disease of perception. Before I even pick up a drink, I can't stand who I am. I want to be someone else doing somewhere else, some, somewhere else doing something. I can't stand being me. I can't stand being in my own skin. This is already at the age of 9 or 10 years old. I was always that last cut from the hockey team. That guy that would, I had three brothers that played top level hockey. They were all great hockey players. And I was always the last cut from that hockey team. And the coach would call me into that office and he'd say, I'm sorry, Eric, but we're going to send the boys to the A team. You're going to the B team. So again, what are they trying to say? They're saying, okay, they're going here. You're going here. Now again, is that what they're trying to get across to a nine or 10 year old boy? Of course not. But to me, that's the disease of perception of how I feel about myself. The miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous is not a change in what I see, but a change in how I see it. And by going through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, I've come to a completely, a, a completely different outlook on that on, on all those days. And that's what happened, just the disease of perception. I really believe the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous is geared towards three things. The first thing I think the big book is geared towards is to find a power that will help you solve your problem. To find that power, if you want to call it God, if you want to call it Allah, if you want to call it a creator, whatever you do, just you've got to find some kind of power. And I really believe the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous' main purpose is to, feed, is to find that power. You know, we all sit here and we talk about the 164 pages, which is the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and which is really important. But there's another two-thirds of that book. And that two-thirds of that book is so important. 
Because in each story, it describes how each individual has come to believe in a power greater than themselves. And that's so important because alcoholics need to identify with each other. They need to find somebody that they can identify. That's the beautiful thing about Alcoholics Anonymous is that it's one alcoholic talking to another. One alky talking to another so we can identify. And so we can identify and those two th the two-thirds of that book is so important. The 164 pages is incredibly important, too, because that's the program of action that's in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that we got to take. So I really, really believe the first thing the big book is geared towards is to find that power greater than yourself. The second thing I think the big book is geared towards is to love yourself again. As I talked about earlier on, I, we, we come in here and we hate who we are. We hate the people we are. And I really believe the big book and the second thing the big book is geared towards is to like who we are again. And the only way I've known to be able to do that is through the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. The third thing I think the big book is geared towards, you see, in the big book and in the doctor's opinion, it says something like this. It says that we are people that are full flight from reality. Folks, that means I'm not in touch with it. It's not just saying that I'm a little out of touch with reality. It's saying I am full flight from reality. I am not in touch with reality whatsoever. So I really believe the third thing the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous is geared towards is to get back in touch with reality. The first thing to find a power greater than yourself. The second thing to like who you are and to love yourself again. And the third thing is to get back in reality. And for some reason when we do that, we become responsible and productive members of society. And that's the way Alcoholics Anonymous works. I'm going to talk a little bit about my drinking. As I said before, and I think it's really important, because when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, they said, Eric, it's the first drink that gets you drunk. I said, you people are bad drinkers. <laughs> first drink that gets you drunk? Who are you kidding? First drink that gets you drunk. Thank God for good sponsorship. And I'm going to go into this just a little bit, and then I'll get into, in, into the, the first drink of alcohol. Thank God. If you're new to Alcoholics Anonymous, if you're new here, please do me a favor. Find out what your problem is. Because there's no way we can move on to the solution until we find out what our problem is. If I was to say to people out there right now and go out in the street right now and say, an alcoholic, tell me what you think an alcoholic is. What are people's first description of an alcoholic? A guy with a paper bag and a bottle and a long trench coat sitting on a park bench somewhere. And that was what my impression was. Who gives out that impression? The non-alcoholic. The non-alcoholic. We know here what alcoholism, and we know what an alcoholic is here today. And then the doctor's opinion, it explains it beautifully. And in the first 52 pages of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it talks about two things. It talks about what happens to Eric when he takes a drink, and what happens to Eric when he doesn't have a drink. When I take a drink, I have this thing that only happens to one out of every ten people. It's called the phenomenon of craving, and it's called the allergy of the body. And I didn't know that when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't know that I had an allergy of the body. And once I take a drink of alcohol, I develop this thing called the phenomenon of craving, and I can't stop drinking. And that has been proven to me over and over and over again. The only times I ever stop drinking is if there was no money left or if there was no booze left. And my other problem is once I stop drinking, all I can think about is where am I going to get my next drink? And that's what the doctor called the obsession of the mind. The obsession of the mind. You know, it's like a big fat idea that outweighs every other idea until I say something like this. I think I'm going to go for a drink, and this time it's going to be different. This time it's going to be different. And it never was, you know. And then in the doctor's opinion, the rest of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it talks about the spiritual malady. As my sponsor's sponsor, and some of you might know my sponsor's sponsor, who died about two years ago. He died on June 10th, 2004, AA's birthday at 46 years of sobriety, Bobby Dobson. He used to say that we have what we call a soul sickness, gangrene of the soul. You know, 
the spiritual malady. And if we straighten out physically and we straighten out mentally, sorry, if we straighten out spiritually, we will straighten out physically and mentally. And that's the deal here in Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't know that that was my problem. And I didn't know that there was a solution to this deal. My whole solution was just drinking. And that's the only solution I had ever known. So for me, when I got told that, and thank God for good sponsorship, that they put those things through me. They also said the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous is not a book that's meant to be studied. It's a book of instructions and directions that have to be followed have to be followed to have that spirit for what Dr. Bob and Bill call the spiritual experience or spiritual awakening. If studying the big book helps you to do what's in it, it's a beautiful thing. But the reality is, is I've got to take the action. You know, I've got to continuously take the action in Alcoholics Anonymous if I want to get better. And I'm going to go back to that first drink. We're members of the Bayview Country Club. And a country club is an alcoholic's paradise. You write your number down and your name, and they give you whatever you want, and they don't care how old you are. I still remember the number, H920. <laughs> H920. And the beautiful thing about that is at the end of the month, the club sends the bill to your dad. <laughs> My parents were separated at this time. I'm about 15, 16 years old. My parents are separated at this time, and I'm going down to the Baby Country Club, and I'm going down by myself on a Monday night because it was within walking distance. And I am drinking on a regular basis down at the Baby Country Club by myself. I would go in there. I'd watch Monday night football. I might play a little cards in the card room. I'd leave there at about 11, 11.30 on a Monday night, and I'd go home. This is a school night. Maybe some early signs of alcoholism. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe some early signs. And I would do that on a regular basis. And I also had this thing they called big shotism. And I'd take all my buddies over there and we'd have steak and we'd have lobster <laughs> and we'd have B-52s and we'd have the finest wine in the world and smell it and do all that and put it back. I got to tell you, I had a hilarious experience the other day. I was at a business function and it was a wine tasting function. And I listened to these people talk. And they're saying, you should taste the steak, take a bite of the steak, and then taste the wine because the wine tastes completely different. And I'm sitting there going, this is unbelievable. <laughs> and they've got ice wine going, the after-dinner wine, the before-dinner, the dessert wine. And I'm just looking at these people going, this is unbelievable. I can't believe what I'm seeing here. You know, because I'm so used to just drinking. <laughs> Social drinking doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. Social drinking is alcohol abuse. I've come to understand something about social drinkers, though. You see, when social drinkers go out and they have a couple drinks, and after a couple drinks, the waitress will come up to them and says, would you like a third? And they'll say, no, thank you very much. I'm starting to feel it. <laughs> and what I've come to understand about the social drinker is there's a change going on with them. Their environment does not threaten them on a regular basis. <laughs> They are not ill at ease 99% of the time. <laughs> they like the people they are. And so when a change starts to happen to a social drinker, they stop because they don't like it. Not the alcoholic. Once that change starts to happen, the alcoholic who can't stand herself or himself whose environment threatens them on a regular basis, who is ill at ease 100% of the time, has a couple drinks, and they start to get rocketed into the fourth dimension. <laughs> you know? They start to get rocketed into the fourth dimension. Going back to that story. So my dad would get the bill at the end of every month, and the sixth or seventh of every month, he'd phone the house and he'd say, Eric, Eric, you got to stop doing this to me. You can't keep doing this to me. And do you know what I'd say to my dad? I'd say, Dad, I promise I'll never do it again. And do you want to know what, folks? I meant it. I meant it. 
I didn't want to do that stuff to my dad. My dad had given us everything that we needed. He gave us a love, and I didn't want to do that kind of stuff to my dad. But as Robbie was saying tonight, alcohol is cunning, baffling, and powerful. And I'm sure none of you people in Minnesota have done anything like what I'm about to tell you, but I'm going to tell you anyways. <laughs> about two or three months down the road, I would start thinking to myself, and the worst thing an alcoholic can do is start thinking to himself. <laughs> And I would say something like this. I wonder what he really meant by that. <laughs> and I said, I'm going to go to the club for one drink. And I went to the baby country club for one drink. And I left there about eight hours later, so drunk, so disgustingly drunk, I made an ass of myself and I made an ass of my family and I didn't want to do that. That's what one drink of alcohol does to a guy like me. I was coaching a AAA hockey team when I was 26 years old. It was an Ontario Championship hockey team, and I had taken them over, and we were 11-1 in November. And I got called into a meeting, and there were some parents that were not too happy about my drinking. And the president of the organization said, Eric, I'm going to have to let you go. But alcohol, alcoholics, again, they're conners. They can con their way just about into anything. You know, we're good salespeople. And I conned my way into staying under two conditions. Dave said to me, Eric, he says, the first condition is you must seek professional help. Dave, no problem. I'll seek professional help. I had absolutely no intention of seek, seeking professional help. The second thing he said to me, and this was the kicker, he said, Eric, you can't drink at Double Rink Arena's bar. Folks, he's not even asking me to quit drinking. He's just saying stay at a one bar in Toronto. That's all he's saying to me. Stay at a one bar in Toronto. Two weeks later, I'd start thinking of myself again. <laughs> and I'd say something like this. I wonder what he really meant by that. We had a game at Double Rink Arenas at 11.30 on a Saturday afternoon. I went into Double Rink Arenas Bar at 1.15 for one drink. I left Double Rink Arenas Bar about eight hours later, so drunk, so disgustingly drunk, I made an ass of myself again, and I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to do that. That's what one drink of alcohol does to a guy like me. And that had been proven to me over and over and over again. If you're new to Alcoholics Anonymous and you build up a bright outlook upon you and your family and you continue to tear that down on a senseless number of sprees and you fail to recognize without sufficient force the pain and humiliation of a day, a week, or a month ago and you continue to do that over and over and over again and you're not alcoholic, what are you? What are you? You would do well to contract this disease. <laughs> this is the only disease in the world that if you catch it and you do something about it, you get better. If you don't catch it, you die an inch a day for years and years and years. You see, I didn't understand that. And the reality is, is I love Alcoholics Anonymous so much, and I want to try and give away as much as I can here in this deal, because I'm like the rest of the speakers are here. And I thank God for great sponsorship like my sponsor, Butch, because we drive each other. We keep doing the deal in Alcoholics Anonymous, and we want people to get the deal. You see, I'm enthusiastic about this whole program. My last month of drinking was impressive, folks. I lost my job. I had a little money in the bank. I'd get up in the morning. I'd go to the liquor store at about 10 o'clock because that's what time the liquor store opens if anybody needs to do any more drinking. <laughs> I'd do that. I'd go to the bar. I'd pick up a 40-ounce or a rye. I'd go to the bar. I'd uh, go and have a little lunch, a couple crackers, a few beers. I'd go home. I'd crack that 40-ounce or I'd start drinking the rye and coke. I'd pass out at about 12 o'clock that night. I'd get up at about 6 in the morning. I'd do my aerobics over the toilet. <laughs> Have a couple more drinks, go back to bed, head to the liquor store. 10 o'clock, that liquor store opens, grab another 40-ounce or a rye. I'd go, to the, I'd go to the bar, have a couple crackers and a beer. 
I'd go home, I'd crack that 40 ounce, or I'd have a couple of drinks until about 12 o'clock that night. I'd go to bed, I'd get up in the morning, I'd start doing my aerobics over the toilet. And I did this over and over and over again. And that last four days of drinking, I had picked up a case of beer before I came to the baby group on that Sunday night, and I'd picked up a case of beer, and the beer just wasn't working anymore. I was so physically, physically ill. I was so mentally beaten up. As Robbie talked about earlier on, they talk about the comprehen immoral, comprehensible immoral demoralization, whatever they say. And there's another line in that book that describes it perfectly for me. I was beaten into a state of reasonableness. I was ready to reason because I tried to get drunk with that case of beer and I couldn't do it. I drank that whole case of beer and it wasn't doing it. wasn't stopping the noise anymore. It might have stopped the shakes, but it just wasn't doing the deal. And I can remember that Sunday afternoon before I came into that group that night, I was shaking like a leaf. And I've never, ever seen a hotter day in Ontario, Canada than that day. It had nothing to do that I was withdrawing from alcohol, but it was so hot in that place that day. And I told you what happened. The next day, my brother and I told you at the beginning of the story what happened to me coming into the baby group, and I did what I did and all that kind of stuff. And I went up to a friend of my brother's after that meeting that night, and I said, Eldon, I think I, had a pro I, think I have a problem with booze, and I want to do something about it. And he said, you know, you're going to have to quit all that other stuff too. And I said, I know I'm going to have to do that, but I'm willing to do anything because I want to stay sober more than I want to drink. If my sponsor had asked me to go dance naked on Young Street, the busiest street in Toronto, I would have done it because I wanted to stay sober more than I wanted to drink. If he told me to jump, I would have jumped. I would have done anything he told me to do because I wanted to stay sober more than I wanted to drink. My brother Paul, who I talked about earlier on, said, I don't want you to pick a sponsor. I don't want you to pick a home group. I'm going to take you to 30 meetings in 30 days, and that's exactly what Paul did. Now, I don't recommend that a lot of times because I'll tell you what, helping loved ones is probably the hardest thing he's ever done in his life. And I've heard a lot of people talk about that. Helping loved ones is difficult. And why it's difficult is because we have expectations. Elkies have expectations. And if those expectations don't get met, what happens? We get resentful. And that's why we're always pushing people, our kids or whoever, on to other people and doing stuff like that. But my brother Paul took me, and he took me to 30 meetings in 30 days. And I thank God for Paul. As I said earlier, Paul's my hero. He really is, because Paul's the one that saved my life. If you were to ask Paul today, what's the happiest moment in his life, beside his two, two children being born in his marriage, he would probably say, and watching his little brother Eric get sober. Watching his little brother Eric get sober. Probably the greatest thing that happened to him. After that 30 days was up, <coughs> I ended up picking the baby group of Alcoholics Anonymous to be my group. I ended up picking a sponsor. I thought he was an Italian gangster. He turned out just to be Italian. <laughs> his name was Jerry C. And Jerry was in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous. He was busy in this deal. He was doing the deal on a regular basis. I can remember being at our first business meeting. I'm about 30 days sober. I a little longer than that, 45 days sober. Bayview has a business meeting. We call it a responsibility meeting, actually, because we don't do business in AA. So we have a responsibility meeting. We have about 45 people at this meeting. There's a lady sitting up there chairing the meeting. And Jerry says, I want you to shut up. I want you to take the cotton out of your ears and put it into your mouth, and I don't want you to say a word. I said, no problem, Jerry, no problem. I'm ready to go, ready to go, <laughs> ready to go. And the lady says, she says, we need people to set up the baby group Sundays and Thursdays. And Jerry put his hand up. And I'm going, oh, boy, I picked a good sponsor. This guy's unbelievable. You know, what a guy. Eric will take care of Thursdays and Sundays. <laughs> That was my entrance into Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> and Jerry got me doing a whole bunch of things. He got me going to Roundux. He got me, he got me in, he got me to the Ontario Regional Conference at seven months sober. He was a hotel chair at that deal. And he got me busy in that, saving the seats for the speakers, <laughs> doing security in the, in here and doing that kind of stuff. I'm here to tell you folks, I started that job at seven months sober. And as I told you earlier on, I chaired that conference last year. That's an amazing deal. 
That just doesn't happen to a guy like me. And Jerry wasn't one of those guys that said, you know what, Eric, we're going to wait three years before we start the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. We're going to wait till you feel better. Feel better. Jerry got me involved in the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous right away. And he got me doing the deal in this thing. And we, by the time I was six or seven months sober, I did my fourth step in El- fourth and fifth step in Alcoholics Anonymous. And we went on with the rest of the program. And I kept on doing the deal. There's a few things Jerry said to me that I think are really important that I just want to share with you. And he talked about the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he read the things in the 12 and 12. He read the, there's a little thing in the 12 and 12 that says that AA is a group of principles, spiritual in nature, that if followed as a way of life will expel the obsession to drink and allow the sufferer to become usefully and happily whole. He told me things in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, like I told you, about, you know, the big book is not a book that's meant to be studied. It's a book of instruction to directions that have to be followed for us to move on with this deal. You know, he said, we can read everything in that big book and we can know every dictionary meaning in that big book, but if we're not going to put that deal into action, it's going to be absolutely a moot point. Simple as that. You know, he says, you got to continue to do this action on a regular basis. you got to keep this deal going and going and going. And I said, I know I have to do that. In the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it talks in there, it says that we have a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. And if you listen to people say that, what they say is they say we have a daily reprieve contingent on our spiritual condition. And they leave out the most important word. We have a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual direction, uh, spiritual condition. And I tell you folks, and I think you got it from the people that were here this weekend and the speakers and the people that do these committees and the people that are working in Alcoholics Anonymous on a regular basis that I can't live on yesterday's sobriety. If I'm not doing this deal on a regular basis, I'm going to be in trouble. At about four years sober, at about three and a half years sober, I had to, uh, I got in an AA relationship and it didn't work out. We met at the coffee pot. (laughs) And I'll tell you what happened. I went through a real difficult time at that period. I went through a period where, you know what, it was just black. And I know there's somebody in this room tonight that is going through that. And you're sitting here going, it's so black, I don't know what I'm going to do. But I'm here to tell you what happened to me, and if this can help somebody, that's great. What happened to me at three and a half years sober is I went through this black period, and I started to understand why I drank in the first place. Because I didn't want to feel the stuff I was feeling. I just didn't want to feel that. And I was was still going to AA meetings in this relationship, but I'd really put her as my higher power. And I was coming to meetings late and leaving early and doing all that kind of stuff. And I'll never forget what an old timer said to me. He says, what do we do? When everything else fails, what do we do? We work with another alcoholic. And I went out there and I found myself an alcoholic. And this guy I didn't let go of for a year. And this guy thought I was great and he was busy saving my life. This guy thought I was great and he was busy saving my life. Another thing that happened is Jerry went through some personal problems, so I had to uh, had to find another sponsor. His name was Bill Clearwater. He doesn't mind me breaking his anonymity because he always he always does. And probably the greatest thing that ever happened to me is Billy took me through the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous page by page, and it took us a year to go through that, and I got to really really understand the program that I didn't have. I got to really understand that somewhere between three and ten years, we find out the real asses we are. (laughs) We've done all the steps. We've worked the traditions. We're busy in service. We're doing all that great stuff. And believe me, folks, that's an important thing. But there's a principle at each step in our program. And I had to ask myself, and Billy put me right through this, and he said, Eric, are you working these principles in all areas of your life? Because I can tell you what, folks, it's so easy to sit up here for me and pontificate from the podium and tell you how great things are and all that kind of stuff. But how am I treating the guy at the variety store? How am I treating the taxi driver? How am I treating my family? 
And ever since that time when me and Billy went through that book, and as I said, it took about a year, my life changed so dramatically. And I got to understand that I got to do this deal in Alcoholics Anonymous on a regular basis. I love this program so much and for what it's done for me and my family. And I get to, I, I get to be active in this program on a regular basis. I get to come to Minnesota and speak to a whole bunch of people. You know, you guys think I'm taking time out of, the, the, you guys wouldn't believe what this does for me. You know, you wouldn't believe what it is to set up my home group. You know, to do all the stuff. I'm busier in AA today than I ever have been. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Because this is the greatest deal in town, folks. There is nothing like Alcoholics Anonymous. I remember Peg M saying she was a member of, uh, her sponsor came up and said, what are you, a member of BB? She said, what's BB? BB? All I know is it ain't AA. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about our circle and triangle, then I'm going to get out of here. Because I think this is really important. This is really how I try and conduct my life today. It talks about the unity of the program, the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the fellowship is an incredibly important part in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's where we connect one-on-one -on -one with each other. It's where we can sit there as alcoholics and we can win the confidence of another alcoholic over in a hurry. One thing I've come to understand about the fellowship, the fellowship is there to support us. It does not change us. We need the fellowship so badly, but it's not going to change us. And we put sometimes we put people on pedestals, and sometimes I don't think it's wrong putting people on pedestals because you know what? The giants of Alcoholics Anonymous, I look up to them and I still look up to them. But the reality is, is that we're alcoholic. I can remember when I was four years sober, I figured out that my first sponsor, Jerry, was an alcoholic just like me. <laughs> See, we forget sometimes. We forget, you know. And the fellowship is really important. So the unity part of the program is fellowship, and we need that. And then it talks about the recovery part of the program. What is the recovery part of the program? It's a practical program of action that's outlined in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's its 12 steps. It's its 12 traditions. It's its 12 principles. It's its 12 concepts. Am I trying to work those things all in my life? And I'm a real big believer that you cannot have the fellowship without the recovery part of the program, and you can't have the recovery part of the program without the fellowship. It's all one. It's all one. And then it talks about the service part of the program. What is the service part of the program? You know, I took another month at my home group setting up, and I love setting up because I think it's the best job in AA. Because that's where it all happens, folks. It's coming here to these conferences are beautiful things, but there's nothing like group night. Nothing like home group. Because home group is where they come. Home group is where the drunks come and get busy and do it. And, and that's where we help people the most is at home group. And my home group, as I said, I take it two or three times a year for a month at a point, and I'm busy at that. You know, when I do the, do I do the phones at 234 Eglinton, which is our inner group office in Toronto? Yes, I do that. You know, am I the GSR of my group? Yes, I do that. Again, when I'm asked to set up my group, do I do those things? Yes, because I'll tell you folks, no is not in my vocabulary anymore. When I get asked to do something, I do it. Because Alcoholics Anonymous has saved my life. And probably the greatest gift of all, the greatest gift of all, is to be able to help another alcoholic one-on-one. -on -one. I sponsor six or seven guys, and I take them through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous the exact same way that my sponsor took me through it. And I watch guys light up. I watch guys, I watch that book come alive right in front of their faces. And again, they think I'm great, and I'm busy, and they're busy saving my life. You know, that's the deal. You know, it's like Robbie was talking tonight, and, you know, the guys that Joe has talked to about it is that, you know what, in Alcoholics Anonymous, I love guys like my, my sponsor, sponsor, Bobby D, D, who came here for 46 years and gave his life to Alcoholics, Alcoholics Anonymous. And there's many people in Toronto that do the same thing, and I know you guys have them here too, the Giants and Alcoholics Anonymous. But what happens to a lot of people in AA is they start to get their goodies back.
The wife comes back, the job comes back, everything comes back, and AA becomes a low priority. You know, AA becomes a low priority. And they wonder why four or five years later they're feeling miserable. If they're not drunk, they're feeling miserable and they can't figure it out. Thank God for me and good sponsorship again because I hope I never get that way about Alcoholics Anonymous because I can never repay this deal. Never. But I'm sure going to try. I'm sure going to try and repay this deal on a regular basis. So if I'm in the unity part of the program, the recovery part of the program, and the service part of the program, I'm in the circle of love, and there's nothing that can go wrong. Now, does that mean that life is great all the time? Of course not. People die. Jobs are lost. You know, all sorts of things can happen. Curveballs in life, I like to call them. But the reality is, is I don't have to drink, and I've got the spiritual set of tools here in Alcoholics Anonymous to get through anything. And I've got the people like my sponsor, Butch, who will help me through anything, you know. And I know I can get through it. I'm convinced of that. I understand today that I'm a child of God. And I really believe that we're all God's kids. You know, it's no different. The beautiful thing about Alcoholics Anonymous and in Bill's story, when Ebby comes and, and gives the message to Bill, and the difference between Alcoholics Anonymous and the rest of the religions out there, and I'm going to tell you, when Ebby came to Bill... And Bill and Abby said to Bill, why don't you choose your own conception of God? That's when the message went to a spiritual message instead of a religious message. See, what we're saying here in Alcoholics Anonymous, we don't care what you believe in. Religion tells you you have to believe in this. Alcoholics Anonymous says, hey, you believe in what you want to believe in as long as you believe in a power that will help you solve your problem." A lack of power is our dilemma. And if I'm in that circle of love, nothing can go wrong. You know what I mean? Absolutely nothing can go wrong. What a wonderful way to live. I'm going to tell you a little thing that happened to me about a month and a half ago, then I'm going to sit down. This was quite a traumatic experience for me, and it taught me a few little lessons. I was driving on the road, uh, an intersection in, in Aurora, which is just north of the city. It's called Bloomington Side Road and Bayview. And I was driving up to Bayview. I was driving on Bayview up to Bloomington Side Road, and all of a sudden I saw this truck hit the traffic light and go down this abutment on the corner. And I watched it go down, and I'm pulling up because the truck's coming this way. It goes down the abutment, and I'm going like that. And I pull over the side, and I go over, and I see if the truck driver's okay. And all of a sudden, I see the truck driver get out of the car, and he starts running around the other side. So I go down the hill, and I come around the other side, and there I see a car that's completely smashed in. And I see a dead guy. And I've never seen anything like that before. This guy was 35 years old. And the story that I'm trying to get across here is that, you know what, life is so short. We never know what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, we're always in a hurry to get from here to there. And, you know, it's just a race around this world. It's so important for us to live life to the fullest. It's so important for us to slow down. Easy does it. This guy was 35 years old, probably had a kid and a wife or a couple kids, and he was gone like that because he was in a hurry to make a left-hand turn. Slow down, enjoy life, and make the most of life. And if you're here in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know deep down inside that this is the way for us to live. Keep doing this deal. Keep getting busy in AA. I always end my talks with a little story. It's about an old man walking down a cold and dark road. In the middle of the road, he sees a snake. And the snake says to the old man, please, sir, pick me up and nurse me back to health. I'm dying. And the old man says, I can't do that. He says, you're a poisonous reptile, and surely if I was to pick you up and nurse you back to health, you'd bite me. And the snake said, not if you save my life. So the old man picked up the snake and put him on the inside of his jacket. And when the snake got to feel a little bit better, he bit the old man. And the old man threw the snake back down to the side of the ground. And he looked at the snake and he said, I thought you said you wouldn't bite me if I saved your life. And the snake looked at him with a snickering grin and said, You knew what I was when you picked me up. 
my friends, if you're in the confines of a bar room, cocktail lounge, or even your own living room, and you decide to take the plug out of the jug or the cork out of the bottle, rationalize it, those that will listen. Justify it to yourself. If you've been here, and if you know me, and if you met us, you knew what it was when you picked it up. Thank you so much for having me at Gopher State. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.